Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. Happy Thanksgiving. Uh, we, we're so excited um, to be able to be here today. Uh, with you and celebrate Thanksgiving together. And I think in our nation, uh, we have a lot to be thankful for. I think we have a lot to be grateful for uh, in our homes and in our families. I know that for some of us, 2023 hasn't brought the things that maybe we expected it to. Maybe 2023 has been a harder year than we thought it would be. But I want to encourage you that there's always things to be grateful for. In the midst of any trial, in the midst of any, any triumph, there's always something to be grateful for. And let's not forget that when we get a victory, let's actually be thankful to the one who gave us that victory. I think sometimes it's easy to forget, and we're going to go through a bit of this story. I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's because I'm excited to share today what God has placed on my heart. And today's message is called A Batitude of Gratitude. A Batitude of Gratitude. I know it's impossible to see, um, but it does say there, A Batitude of Gratitude, okay? It says it in there. Now, some of you are like, yeah, I can see it, no problem. Others of us were like, yeah, there's, all I see is white, right? Like, I don't see nothing else, but A Batitude of Gratitude. And I think I think maybe you've heard this before. Whoa, I'm gonna trip. Um, maybe you've heard this before. Uh, people always saying, have an attitude of gratitude. You ever heard that before? And we love that because, number one, it rhymes. And it's like, we love rhymes as humans. We just love things that like flow and rhyme. I think that's why we like poetry and why we like it is because it, it flows really well. It rhymes, it has some rhythm. It sounds good, but it's not just, it doesn't just sound good, it's also true. I think as believers, we're supposed to have this attitude of gratitude when we go out through life. And I remember when I was a kid, I was probably uh, five or six years old, and my sister, uh, she is two years, well, 18 months younger than I am. So me, as eight, being 18 months older than her, I am so much more mature than her, right? Especially when I was three, and she was like, like one. Like, she was so immature. And and sometimes she would just scream and she'd have bad attitudes. And what my sister would say is whenever she'd have a bad attitude, she'd always say, Mom, I'm having a bad attitude. She'd say that every time. A bad attitude. And I, and I, like, at the time thought it was funny but also kind of annoying. I'm like, well, then stop having a bad attitude. But then, like, I would have a bad attitude. You know, like when kids, you know what's going to be a tough day when you wake up in the morning and one of your kids is in a bad mood? And you know, like, as soon as you're like, okay, well, here we go, right? Like this, and then, and then you know, like, within minutes, your second kid is going to have a bad attitude. Why? Because the first kid does, and they're going to make their attitude spread to everyone else in the room. Right? You've noticed this with kids. Sometimes, like, I'll pick up Jane from, from school or daycare, and I'm like, yo, you're having a tough time today. And I can tell because, she, first of all, she's probably tired and hungry. I think that runs in our family's genes. Being tired and hungry causes you to lose all sight of who you are. Maybe you're the same way. But in our house, that's kind of the way it is. And so if we don't get our meals on time, it's like, yo, you, you all better not want to come over, right? Let us get some food in us. Let us get some rest in us. And then maybe we'll have a better conversation. But this story, and I was thinking of my sister having this bad attitude, this, this bad attitude. I think oftentimes as humans, and maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but I think oftentimes as humans, we know we're supposed to have this attitude of gratitude, but yet our heart is more of a bad attitude. Our attitude towards being grateful is horrible. Because what happens is we see everything around us. We're like, no, I'm not grateful. Look at the problems in my life. Let me point out to you the pain in my life. Let me show you why I can't be grateful. You ever have a conversation like that with somebody? Like, what are you grateful for? Like, I got nothing to be grateful for. I'm like, wow. You got to find some things to be grateful for. Because, you know, to be honest, and maybe you know this, ungrateful people are really hard to be around sometimes. Now, I'm not saying we don't love them, because we do. And you know what? We can even be grateful for people who aren't grateful. But it can be tough to be around people who always walk around as if everything is horrible, and they have no blessings and nothing in their life. All they have in their life, it seems to be, is burdens. But I think a lot of the time when it comes to gratitude, what it actually is, is, our, is where we're looking. You know, for all of us, it's like I can point out the pain points, but can you also point out the victories that you've had this year? Can you point out the blessings that God has given you this year? Do you see them? And I think we have to switch our minds to be a place of having an attitude 
of gratitude, but I think most of the time our attitude, again, is more of a bad attitude. What happens when, when, when it's Thanksgiving weekend and what we see in our lips is grumbling rather than praise? What, it, what, what happens when we look in the mirror and all we see are all the things that we wish were different this year, all the things that we wish we had done different or the dreams we had or the vision we had or the goals we set for ourselves this year, and we're like, ah, oh, it's too late, I didn't make my goals. It's like, well, what can you be grateful, grateful for? And it won't surprise you that gratitude is necessary for true human connection. That if we want to be connected as human beings, if we want to be connected as followers of Jesus, as a family, as a church, we want to be connected. We have to live with a posture of gratitude on our lips. Rather than complaining, we should be celebrating. And I think a lot of the time complaining is what we see. And the Bible is filled with key encouragements when it comes to gratitude, when it comes to thanksgiving. In fact, gratitude or thanksgiving is actually the will of God for us. And I find this so fascinating. If you read in 1 Thessalonians 5:16, it says this, three verses. Number one, always be joyful, never stop praying, and be thankful in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. I think a lot of us were looking, you know, when you work with, we worked with students for a long time. And I think it's not just students, but a lot of people. It's like, you know, at church we call it, what's your calling? In the world we call it, what do you want to do when you grow up, right? Like a similar concept. But what's your calling? Well, a lot of us were searching for the calling. And Jesus is like, and the writer here is just saying, yo, the calling? Always be joyful. Never stop praying and be thankful in all circumstances. If we want to know what God's will is for our life, this is it. And no matter what you do with your work, with for your career, whatever that is, no matter your position, no matter your title, always be joyful. Never stop praying and be thankful in all circumstances. Now right there are three things that I look at my life and I'm like, I got a lot of work to do. I got a lot of work to do when it comes to always being joyful. I got a lot of work to do when it, when it comes to never stop praying. I got a lot of work to do when, it, when I'm supposed to be thankful in every single circumstance. Everyone, as followers of Jesus, we're supposed to be grateful. People should, when they look at us, should see people of gratitude. And they should see Jesus in us. They should see that we're different than everybody else. What makes us different is that we're joyful in every, in, in, we're always joyful, that's what I'm trying to say. Always joyful. We never stop praying and we're thankful in every circumstance. Now those are the kind of people that we want to be around. Or these are the kind of people that's like always joyful. Sometimes we get up in the morning on the wrong side of the bed and we don't want to be around the joyful people. It's like it's 5 a.m., why are you smiling? I haven't had my seventh cup of coffee yet. I've only haven't had my second breakfast yet. Why are you so happy? That's what we're supposed to be. People who are joyful and people who are always thankful. But we know that gratitude is important. We know that it's beneficial. We know that the beauty of gratitude. But I think we all know it's still challenging to live it out. It's not easy to be grateful in every circumstance. It's not easy to praise God when things aren't, aren't going well in our life or in our family or at work. It's not easy. So I want to give us a couple things today that a attitude of gratitude will do in our lives. And how do we determine our attitude right now towards gratitude? I have three things. So three things that will, are some things that will come when our minds are, are in a place of attitude towards gratitude. Number one is we become green with envy. This is what happens when gratitude isn't a part of our story. Envy is what builds up inside of us. And I think, you know, it's so fascinating, and maybe you've seen this. You know, you, those of us who have been in church for a long time, there's a couple of things that people don't often ask for prayer for. And one of them is envy. Like as a pastor, I've been a pastor now almost 10 years. And I've never once had somebody come to me and say, hey, I need prayer for envy. I've never had it happen, Ever. Number two, and we're going to get into this later, but it's greed. I've never had someone come to me and be like, yo, I'm just so greedy. Can you pray for me? I've never had this happen. But do you know what I also know about humanity? Is I would say a lot of us are envious and greedy at the heart. 
And we have to switch this in our minds. We don't ask for prayer for it. Why? Because we don't even sometimes realize it's inside of us. Because what happens when, when envy comes in is we see what other people have and it creates a life where we're always striving to have what somebody else wants, the bigger car or the nicer car or the bigger house or the faster motorcycle or the better Milwaukee saw. I don't know what a saw is. I'm just joking. I know what a saw is. I'm just kidding. You're like, you don't know what a saw is. You're like, I used one a couple times. When I was a kid, we had this big piece of plywood, and we tried to cut it in half to make skateboard ramps with a handsaw. We got like four inches into it and thought, yeah, this is not going to work for us. And then I saw a YouTube video 20 years later where a guy's like, it took him 15 seconds, not even five seconds to cut a whole thing. We're like, where was that when we were kids? We become so envious. Envy always tells you that we need the new thing, the most improved thing. It tells us that, we, that we, what we don't have is what we actually need. And we'll do whatever it takes. We'll pay whatever it costs. We'll go into debt to get it in order to, for us to think that we'll feel happy. But how many know when you finally get it, there's always something more that you're going to want. There's always something better that you're going to want. And they see this because they, they trick us because they put out a new iPhone now I have the iPhone 13 Pro Max. It's a nice phone. But now they have a new one. Now I'm like, I, my phone sucks. I need a new phone. And they do this every year with every product. It's like, I got the new 2020 Ram. But then they all of a sudden forget to put in all these incredible features that are going to change your entire life. If you don't have them, you don't even know how to drive anymore. You ever seen a kid try and parallel park without a backup camera? You ever seen me? I'm joking. I can, I can parallel park. I'm, I'm actually like, it's one of my three gifts is parallel parking. This is what envy does in our life. We'll do whatever it takes. Even if that, the cost is our career, our relationships, our money, or time. Number two is greed takes over. When our attitude towards gratitude is bad, yeah, again, greed is such a common thing, yet it's not really talked about. So what happens when we're greedy, and you see this, is we can't be generous because in our own minds we feel like we don't have enough. We're always on this quest to try and get more, and that, and that quest to get more, do you know where that leaves you? Is a place of loneliness and isolation. Because what happens is when we're greedy, we'll use people, we'll use time, we'll, we'll try and manipulate things so we can get our way, so we can build ourselves up, so we can build our bank account out. Greed tells me that I'll never be enough and that what I have will never be enough. And greed will destroy you in the greatest of relationships. This is what happens when our attitude is poor. Number three is that circumstance will cloud our minds. And you notice this, because circumstance really affects so many things, but it really affects our place of thanksgiving and gratitude. You know, we all go through moments where things are tough, or life is hard, where sickness comes, or whatever, and it's like it's so tough that oftentimes the biggest thing that we don't hear people saying is, I'm thankful for, or I'm grateful for. And you know why this is, is because our hope is in the wrong things. Our foundation is weak. Our foundation is based on things that change and things that are temporal rather than things that are eternal. Jesus always says, seek first the kingdom, then all will be added. And we're called to build his kingdom, not our own. And so our circumstance clouds our minds when we're actually not being grateful. And number four, and this is so dangerous, is that people become our competition. Other churches become our competition. Our employees, our co-workers become our competition and I see that Jane and Marin are having competition. And Marin can barely sit. This is what happens is we become so competitive with one another. And we think that, that if we truly want to be successful, that means somebody else has to fail in order for me to be successful. If I want to get the promotion, that means you're not going to get it. And if you get the promotion, that means I'm not going to get it. And now I'm mad at you. Because you got what I want. You ever told somebody about something you want and then a week later they have that exact thing? Did that have that happen? And you're like, oh. We're not supposed to be competitive and competing against one another. 
We're supposed to be celebrating and pushing each other forward. But there's so many benefits of gratitude in our life too. Those are some of the things. Maybe you see yourself in some of those areas of greed or, or, or whatever. But the next question is, what does an attitude of gratitude do? I want to give us four shifts gratitude does in our lives and four practical ways we can grow gratitude in that area in ourselves and those around us. So let's go. Number one, gratitude produces joy. Gratefulness and joy intermingle. Some of the most joyful people I know in my life, the most joyful people I've met in my life are oftentimes the people who have the least and give the most. Some of the most joyful people are those who live in a place where joy reigns in their life because of how grateful they are. We can produce joy in one another by being grateful. When somebody does something, can you just say, hey, great job. You did great today. You know, there's a story of Jesus. He's healing. He heals 10 people from a terrible sickness. I want to read this. It's fascinating. As Jesus continued on towards Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. As he entered the, a village there, 10 men with leprosy stood at a distance. Why? They weren't even allowed to come close. And they're crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And he looked at them and said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. Incredible miracle. Verse 15, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he came back to Jesus, shouting, praise God. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for all he had done. The man was a Samaritan. And Jesus asked, didn't I heal 10 men? He already knew the answer. It's an interesting question. <laughs> Where's everybody else? Where are the other nine? Where are they? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. See, one man, what happened is he got healed and he was so joyful, so grateful for the healing he had received because the life of leprosy was not easy in the least. Outcasts, not allowed to be in contact with their families and kicked out of the cities. Distanced from the people they love. This one man comes back thanking Jesus. But nine of them didn't come back. Now, I think that they were probably excited and grateful, like I would assume. But only one man came back and said, thank you. Joy comes and contentment comes when we are grateful for what we have and what God has already given us. I think the dilemma and the problem that can happen for some of us is the blessings that we prayed for five years ago, if we're not careful and we're not grateful, can become the burdens that we deal with today. We have to be grateful and let it produce joy inside of us. And we always go back to our Savior. We always go back to Jesus. We always go back to God and say, thank you for taking me out of this pit for taking me out of this pain and bringing me to where I am today. One man comes back. And Beth and I, we've tried to shift our language in our home when we talk about this. You know, in our, in our, in our marriage, in our relationship, you know, there's times where Beth's like, yo, you got to do the dishes. And I'm like, I don't want to do the dishes though. And we're probably the only ones who that happens to. Yo, clean up the kids' toys. I'm like, well, Jane has two hands. She's got two feet. She should clean them up. And then I go into my room and all my laundry is on the floor. It's all clean. Been there for three days. Right? And so I think in our life, we try to change our language. So when Beth says, hey, um, do the di can you do the dishes? And, I, and then I don't do them and she does them for me. What I used to say was, I'm sorry I didn't do the dishes. Maybe you've had that conversation before. I'm sorry I didn't do it. I should have done it. We try to change our language. Rather than saying sorry, we say thank you. It's rather than saying sorry that you did them, I say thank you that you did them. Thank you that you did that. Thank you for doing the laundry. Thank you for all of it. Rather than I'm so sorry, I should have done that. It's like, yo, I'm giving her respect. I'm saying thank you for what you did. I know it was my responsibility, but thank you for doing it instead of me. So we need to shift our language. And this language shift produces joy and love in other people. And I want to give us just a practical application for this today. 
and this is it, and it might seem crazy, I want to encourage you over the next week, make a list of 100 things you're grateful for. Some of us, we can barely count to 100. I'm just joking. But 100, it seems daunting, right? It's like 100. I'm telling you, when you start doing this, you'll start to realize everything you actually have. 100 things? Some of us have 100 things or more in storage. At a storage locker we haven't been to in three years. Yet we still pay monthly for it. 100 things. What Can you write down 100 things you're grateful for? I think a lot of us, we'd have an easier time making 100 things that we're angry about. 100 things that we're not comfortable about. 100 things that we're upset about. Be easy. 100 things that you're grateful for. Number two is gratitude develops generosity. And we talk about generosity a lot in our church, and I think it's because it's something, and even if we were here last week, Pastor Jonathan shared, it's always been a part of our DNA as a church is we're a very generous church. It's incredible. God uses each and every one of you to do amazing things, and, and I'm so grateful for each of you. But gratitude develops generosity. Gen- generosity combats a attitude of gratitude. Because rather than thinking about how can I make myself better, how can I invest more in myself, our attitude shifts to how can I invest in you more? And this is a verse we've preached about before, but it's in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And this is when the believers form a community. It says this, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared meals with great joy and generosity. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Now we preached a whole series on these verses. And it was awesome. But the big thing you see almost in every verse is that they shared. They were generous with each other. They sold their property in order to make sure no one among them was needy. They were so grateful for what God had done in their life. And it brought them joy and it brought them generosity for one another. There were no needs among them, not because they were rich, but because they didn't want to see their brothers and sisters in need and do nothing about it. You know, we become so grateful for what we have when we want to see everyone experience the same blessings that we have. That we feel so blessed with what we have, so we say, I'm going to share what I have so I can share this blessing. God has given you this blessing. Share that blessing with other people. Invite people into your home for a meal. Drive somebody if they need a ride. You know, be generous in all that you do. And Beth and I's daughter, Jane, she's amazing. She's beautiful. She's smart. She's caring. She's loving. She's the best. I love her. She's a hoarder. <laughs> and what I mean by that, you're like, whoa. Like. <laughs> she's learning to share is what I'm trying to say. But she's not the best out of yet. She's learning. But what happens is, is we have our other daughter, Mary, and she's like six months old. And I'll be like, hey, Jane, can you give some toys to her? And I, I, I don't know what goes in her mind because I've never asked, but she looks in her bin and she brings these toys out. And they're the oldest toys I think we ever got her. So she brings her the oldest toys. But it's funny because sometimes I don't ask. I put Marin down on the ground to play and I go away. And I come back. She's surrounded by toys. Because Jane's learning. My sister wants to play with some toys too. It's important for her to learn how to share. You know, sharing is hard for kids. I think sometimes it's harder for adults. Because our possessions aren't just dolls and cars. Our possessions are finances and houses and cars. It's sometimes easier to to share your old Honda 2002 minivan um, Hot Wheels car than it is to share your real one. She doesn't know that yet, right? (laughs) Yeah, I was in Canadian Tire the other day. I thought it was so cool. They have a Hot Wheels vending machine inside this Canadian Tire. And I was like, as a kid, I was like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. And I'm an adult now. I'm like, whoa, that's cool. 
And I didn't check the prices. It was probably astronomical. But the problem is I probably would have bought a car. But I want to encourage you, one practical thing that too this week when it comes to generosity, I want to encourage you to give something this week to somebody anonymously. I don't want you to tell them it was you. Just give something anonymously. Not for the credit. Not to be like, yo, look what I did. Say, I'm going to give something anonymously. I'm just going to be generous this week. Anonymously. There's a big difference between being generous when everyone is watching and there's a big difference between being generous when nobody's watching. I think the most generous acts are those done in private where we get no recognition. There's this big trend on social media right now where people are generous publicly and they get millions of views. And sometimes I think, why are you doing it? Now, I don't know their, their heart, right? I, and I'm not trying to judge their heart, but I think so many times we're grateful when people are watching, but in private, we're not. We're not generous when people aren't watching us. Let's be generous and give something anonymously this week. Number three is gratitude creates hope. It brings us back to a place where our hope isn't, what we, isn't in what we want. It's, not, it's, it's, it's in what we, what we already have, and our hope is in who we serve. We stop spending all our time wishing we had what we don't have. And we start using our time to use what we already have. Some of us, were just wishers. We just wish that we had something. And we have some stuff and we're like, ah, that's not the best. We become hopeful in who we already have. Jesus is the hope of the world. We have to realize that our hope doesn't come from our government. Our hope doesn't come from our pastors. Our hope doesn't come from our careers. Our hope doesn't come from our jobs. It doesn't come from our homes. It doesn't come from our cars. Our hope cannot be in what we have. It has to be in Jesus as our firm foundation. Because when our hope is in our career and we get laid off, now we have no foundation. Now we have nothing. But when our hope is in our Savior, that doesn't change, he doesn't shift, he doesn't move, he, he's always constant, he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. When our hope is in him, our foundation stays strong no matter the storms that come, no matter the earthquake, no matter it all, we can stay strong because our hope is in the right things. And, and James 1.17 says this, every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. He doesn't change. He's always constant in our life, our firm foundation. Our hope is in Jesus. He doesn't change. He's the same. You know, the Bible is filled with encouragement and warnings when it comes to gratitude. And one simple Google search will bring them all up for you. You know, my pr a practical application for, for this, I want to encourage you to spend some time in prayer this week and meditation with Jesus. Take some time this week to put your hope in the right things, not the wrong things. Be grateful that Jesus is on your team, that he's your protector, that he's your provider, that he's your healer, that he's your savior. Spend time with him this week and put your hope in the right things. Put your hope in him. And number four, I want to invite Mike to come. Number four is gratitude understands perspective. You know, what you have right now is what you were praying and hoping for just a few years ago. Right? Some of the things that you were hoping for four years ago, you now have. I remember several years ago, Beth and I were on our honeymoon. That's, that's wrong. We were on our, on our anniversary trip. We got married in January to hope to go away somewhere warm for our anniversaries. So far, we've gone to like Canmore and Vamp, Banff in Montana. Like that's like, might be colder, you know. I remember on this anniversary trip, I forget, I think we were in Canmore and we were talking. We we're like, we got to buy a house. We got it. Like we were feeling God was leading us to buy a house. And we're like, and then we open up our bank account. We're like, yeah, not going to happen. And that year, Beth and I, we moved into our new house in uh, August of that same year. It was unbelievable. And I think sometimes, you know, we were, we were 
hoping for it, and we were excited about it, and then the, mor the mortgage payments started to come in. And we're like, owning a home is harder than it seems, you know. And so what can happen, I shared this earlier, but what can happen is that the things we prayed for five years ago, they're now our reality. But if, we don't, if we're not careful, they be, can become our burden. You know, how many times in our life do we compare what we have to somebody else? Maybe you were praying for the job and you finally found the job of your dreams, but a year later, it's not enough anymore. You didn't get the raise you thought you would. Your coworkers don't pull their weight around the office. Maybe the spouse you were crying out to God for is no longer meeting your expectations. They're no longer filling your needs, so it's time to find someone new. The house you bought by God's grace is now too small to hold all your furniture and TVs. You can't park in your garage anymore because you have too much stuff. So rather than give stuff away and throw things away, you just buy a bigger house. I gotta fit my furniture in my house though. Your perspective matters when it comes to gratitude. And 1 Timothy 6, 6 to 8 says this, yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we, were brought with, uh, brought, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. None of... The things we have come with us when we leave. The only thing that comes with us is the people we impacted, the people we shared Jesus with, the, those who gave their lives to Jesus. We have what we need. And I know there's a lot of people in our city that don't have what they need to survive. If you drive around our city these days, there's a lot of people who are broken and hurting, who are in desperate need. I see it every day. Let's be generous. Let's have the right perspective. And I want to give you the last practical implication. Is I want to encourage you this week to think about the blessings you have now that you were dreaming about five years ago. And remember to be grateful for those things today. Because it's easy to forget. For Beth and I, this, this really came into fruition with our car. There was one day, we had an old Suzuki Swift. An amazing car. It did so many great things for us over the years but near the end as cars do it had some serious 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 problems in fact there was many times our part of our drive home was through the country there's many times where we'd be leaving late at night and our high beams and our lights did not work so we're driving in the pitch black, and I'm not joking, this is a true story. We're driving down this big hill with our four-way flasters on so I can see every second. And I'm, I'm not joking, we're driving one time, this guy, he sees the flasters on and just like flashes his lights at us, like, yo, get your lights on. I'm like, I wish I could. I really wish I could get my lights on right now. I, I, I'm kind of scared. <laughs> like I, I, can, I can barely see. Like I'm telling you, it was like a flash and then I see and then we couldn't see and it was like, like this, if we drive home 10 minutes. There's still so many times, you got a new car. There's still so many times that I think, man, I wish I had a new car with less rust on it and less kilometers on it that was better on gas. And I have to realize, man, that car five years ago was a miracle. There's a miracle for me. And so rather than me, and this is just in my own mind and my own heart, I'm, I'm doing my best to stop complaining about the things that I have and start enjoying the things that I have and the blessings God has given me. Gratitude has this ability to put things into perspective. And ingratitude has the ability to throw away a miracle because it isn't enough anymore. We have to allow gratitude to realign our perspective and to realize that what we have is enough, that we already have more than we need and that I am enough because of who created me. Gratitude is attractive. We love being around grateful people because they're not complainers. They don't complain because they're content and they're grateful for what they have. Let us shift from a bad attitude of gratitude to an attitude of gratitude. You know, our takeaway today is this, is that gratitude is a lifestyle, not just a moment. 
It's not just this one day we say, I'm thankful on Thanksgiving. We're grateful and thankful all year long. It's a lifestyle, not a moment and not a day. That is the power to change our lives. It is the power to ground us on the firm foundation. That will be hard to shift when the storms come. So let's pray together. God, I thank you for this Thanksgiving. God, I pray that you help us be grateful people. God, help gratitude uh, change things inside of us. Help gratitude realign our perspective and help us let gratitude push away all greed and push away all envy from our life and help us just be people who are grateful for everything we have. And God, I pray that as we go out today, God, let us be a light in the darkness. Let us be a light in our schools. Let us be a light in our workplaces. Let us be a light in our homes. And God, I thank you that you're growing known Victory Church and you're doing something powerful and beautiful here And God, help us be aligned with you. In Jesus' name, amen.